Let's start with the rapid fire round. The first one is, at what age do you want to retire? That is a good question, maybe 50. How long does it take you to get ready in the mornings? Oh, uh, 20 minutes. Most embarrassing moment of your life? Uh, in Stockholm, when I lost my key. Uh, I had to run from a shower on a boat all the way to a, uh, the office of the reception, which was, was up a hill. So I was just wrapped in a towel in like minus 10 degrees Celsius. It was crazy. Glad you didn't slip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Favorite color? Favorite color? Uh, red. What time of day are you most inspired? Most inspired? Probably the evenings. How many hours of sleep can you survive on? Oh, uh, probably four or five. Fill in the blank. An upcoming technology trend is blank. Uh, an upcoming, um, I think, artificial general intelligence. The city in which the best kiss of your life happened. <laughs> uh, probably London. Pick one, Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg? Uh, Mark Zuckerberg. The biggest mistake of your career? Thinking when I started my startup that it would be really easy. <laughs> As an all startup one, I think. Yeah. <laughs> How do you relax? How do I relax? Um, normally Netflix or swimming. A habit of yours that you hate? A habit of mine that I hate. Uh, I, sometimes I stress too much, I think. The most valuable skill you've learned in life? The most valuable skill? Uh, persistence. Your favorite Netflix show? Favorite Netflix show? It's probably one of the South Korean dramas, to be honest. I uh, love them, love them. Uh, one word description of your leadership style? Uh, driven. Top priority in your daily schedule? Top priority. Um, achieving as much as possible with, with the time available. Ideal vacation spot. Ideal vacation. Uh, probably in the Nordics, like the cold weather. So, yeah. Uh, key factor for maintaining a work-life balance. Key factor. Um, you know what? I, I don't really have a work-life balance. So I continually work, but I would say key factor is probably um, having a schedule and sticking to it. Memorable career milestone. Memorable career milestone. I think achieving Innovate UK funding in my previous role so that we could proceed with a big artificial intelligence project. Okay. A recent business innovation that caught your attention. Ooh, um, Bill Bryant in Sweden uh, with Amp Studio launched a generative AI model that can generate really cool uh, background music for a, a song or for a film. Um, and it uses really high quality loops. So it's much better than a lot of the other music generating tools out there. Okay, well, that was the end of the rapid fire. Fantastic. <laughs> now we can move on to the longer questions, which you can answer with as much ease or time as you like. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is, can you tell us more about your role as an AI strategist and your journey in the field of AI? Of course, yes. Yeah. So I've been working with AI for over a decade now. Um, I actually started working with AI at my own company, Looks Good On Me, in the fashion sector. Um, and we were using visual recognition tools, which back then were you know, few and far between, and they were nowhere near as good as they are today. Um, but interestingly enough, we were using those tools to recognize details of fashion items so that we could suggest other items in store that might go with them. And I think I, I, met, I met at least three people here today who are using um, the new technology to do similar things. Um, and so it's really interesting to see that still ongoing. Um, and then obviously more recently uh, in my last role at the UK regulator, I was using AI for a couple of things, um, generating um, international multi-territory age ratings um, from, from one viewing of video content. So instead of having to go to every regulator around the world to get age ratings, you could do it all from one to one sitting. And the second project, which was more complex, was actually uh, analyzing video content from a compliance perspective and recognizing where not only the violence occurs, but, but being able to attribute some sort of severity level to it using a combination of visual speech and sound uh, recognition tools. So it was really interesting to 
to kind of build that multimodal fusion model to do that. And uh, I would say, you know, having taking all the learnings from that, all of those projects has put me in a good place, uh, certainly from the creative industry perspective to advise um, on AI strategy. And that's really where my role AI strategists come from. And do you plan to return to any of these projects anytime? Um, really good question. I mean, certainly the media and entertainment industry is one where I think there's a lot of growth and a lot of opportunities. So, you know, may, maybe there's opportunities there, but also I think with the work that, that we were doing in terms of recognizing issues in content, I think there's a lot of, a lot of opportunity in the user generated content space to, to provide better tools for platforms like YouTube. So yeah, absolutely really keen to kind of carry on that work. And are there any interesting lessons that you learned now that you look back at everything you've done uh, that you bring with you today? Yeah, I mean, as I think I mentioned earlier, the persistence is, is so important and having that drive to continue when things go against you. Um, so, you know, with, with, with securing funding, that was a really long process. And if you weren't persistent in, in and believing in your vision, there was no way you could have got over that hurdle and, and achieved that result. So I think, yeah, that, that sort of drive and persistence is, is a key thing that I'll carry with me throughout my career. So you're actively involved in developing AI standards, including ISO, IEC, A23. Could you explain what this standard is and its significance in the AI landscape? Yes, yeah, so I've been part of the BSI and ISO AI committees now for quite some time. The BSI is the British Standards Institute. The ISO is the International Standards Organization. Um, the ISO IEC 8183 is an international standard, a foundational standard for the AI data lifecycle. So it's about how, how we use data in AI projects and how we can optimize that and make sure it's ethically used and how we can mitigate things like bias. So it's all there in that foundational standard as a guide for businesses who are either working on AI projects currently or are thinking about doing so. And all of the other standards around data quality um, and risk that, that are present within the ISO AI standards are kind of make reference to the AI data lifecycle. And that's why we really wanted to get that standard out there um, so that any business approaching these projects can have and can have that as kind of a tool that they can use. Also, we visualize that it can be used by policymakers um, and politicians and things to think about really how they want to, to regulate this area too. And what has the progress in regulation looked like? Like we all know of the letter that Elon Musk and everyone signed once upon a time to regulate progress, but what has been the update on that? So I was very skeptical about that letter. I, I, I don't know if it came from a good place. And what I mean by that is obviously OpenAI have not necessarily uh, been entirely open about the kind of data sources they've used to train their models. And they are in an advantageous position because of that. Um, and I felt that some of the people signing those letters were at and, and calling for regulation were doing so because they were in an advantageous position of building something before regulation and they were potentially looking to restrict others from building tools of a similar nature and competing with them. So I don't know how, um, you know, how, how, whether, whether that came from a good place. Um, the, in terms of the actual regulation, though, it's really interesting to see the EU AI Act coming into force soon. Um, the UK government has more of a, a relaxed approach to AI for the time being, but we've got our AI Safety Summit coming up in November, um, where, where all these kind of issues, core issues, are going to be discussed. And I know the US is in a similar position where they're looking at whether they should bring in regulation or not, because they tend to be more hands-off than, say, the European Union, for example. Um, the, the one challenge the European Union have, from what I can tell with, with the EU AI Act, is it's, it's very clever in terms of it breaking down AI projects into different risk categories. But the issue is there's a number of, of projects that already exist, such as GPT-4, that are being widely used at ChatGPT. Um, and they've already been trained and they're already in public consumption. And the problem is they probably fall into the high risk categories, but what are we gonna do now they're already being used by the public? Are they gonna be withdrawn from the market? Because that would seem to be quite a, uh, an unpopular thing, I would, I would think, because people have got used to using these tools. So how are we going to, to work with tools that are already out there? And I think that's something that will be a challenge for the EUI AI acts, definitely. 
And how does one navigate the challenge of having an international standard in the first place, which may or may not be respected by countries at all? Well, this is, this is a really good question. And, you know, when we, when we got the AI data lifecycle standard approved, I think it was 24 countries all approved it. Um, but you're right that, you know, when, when it's a standard, it's, um, it doesn't have to be adhered to. So it's not a regulation, it's not in law, and it's up to the governments of those countries if they want to use it to, to kind of form le- a, legal, a legal basis for around it. Um, but I do think it's, it's tricky if you have countries that are under tough re- uh, regulation, like for example, with the EU AI Act, and countries that are not, because what you could see is is innovative businesses opting to develop their tools in markets that are less restricted, because then they may be able to use practices that would not be allowed in the restricted market, and then bringing their products, which have had the advantage of maybe more flexibility, to a market like the European Union, and not being entirely honest about how they've trained them. And the issue there is, you know, you've got black box AIs and neural networks, it's very difficult to actually break into those and to find out what data has been used to train them. And so I think that, again, is, a, is an intrinsic problem. If there's not a global accepted uh, regulation around it, um, then we can have all these standards and we can have all this advice, but really then it comes down to the ethics of the company um, and the ethics of the individuals more than anything else. So next one is, what motivated you to become a member of the British and International Standards Organization? AI committees and what kind of work do you do within them? Sure. So in terms of motivation, um, it was actually soon after the Cambridge Analytica scandal broke. Um, Obviously, since then, there's been that book by Brittany Kaiser called Targeted, which I recommend everyone reads, um, which is really fascinating about how AI can be used in a bad way, really, to influence politics, for example. Um, And I was quite concerned about what was being done in standards and to try to try and uh, help governments to form policies that would would kind of stop that sort of thing happening in the future. And so that's why I got involved in the British Standards Institute in the first place. Um, and then the opportunity to work with experts like Julian Padgett, Colin Crone, and Jeremy Swim from Green on the AI data lifecycle standards really got me excited about working in the International Standards Organization as well. And so does the Cambridge Analytica scandal pale in comparison to what has happened since in technology? Um, I'm not sure it pales into insignificance. I think it was still, um, you know, when when you're looking at at uses of AI that are bad, I think that it's it's certainly up there with with the scandals. I mean, obviously, deep fakes are going to be very interesting. Obviously, there's a British election coming up. There's already been one deep fake online of Sir Keir Starmer um, saying things that he didn't say, um, trying to make him look bad. And I think that could be the start of something very bad if we start to have loads of deep fakes before that election to try and influence the result. That's going to be very problematic. It has been, however, a positive thing to see both parties putting out messages, making clear that was a deep fake. So hopefully, if if they carry on in that way and and you know, standing up for for democracy, both parties, stand, key parties, standing up for democracy, I think we can we can avoid any issues there. But certainly, you know, it's it's not it's not a good look that this this far out from the election, which is must be at least six months, they're already deep fakes are already emerging. And so we mostly hear about the negative impacts of AI on politics. Are there any positive impacts of AI on politics? Um, you know what, I think in, in the future, AI can be a really useful tool to predict how certain policies will impact um, the public. And I think that, you know, we might even be able to get to a point where we can rely on AI tools to shape strategy uh, from an economic perspective. So I think that there are benefits that we could see from, from AI and politics, um, but certainly as well, there are negatives as, as, in, as with everything. It really depends on the use case. So in one of your posts, you mentioned the importance of ethical and responsible AI development. Mm. Uh, how do you advocate these principles in your work? 
So certainly in, in the projects I've been in work, I've, I've worked on, we've always had an AI ethics committee. Um, I think that's really important. And we've always had independent voices come in as well, because it's very difficult for a company to, to look at their own products and analyze them from an ethical perspective without having an independent voice in there as well to look at them and to feed into that. So we worked very closely with the University of Bath and had their representation on there. We had other external parties too. And I, th I think that's a really important thing for companies to take away from this, that I would recommend an AI ethics committee, but do make the investment in bringing in a, a, outside voices, if you like, to, to feed into your, to your ethics program. And besides these two, are there any other best practices or frameworks you recommend for organizations looking to prioritize ethical AI development? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the ISO standards, so the International Standards Organization standards, um, and also sometimes the, the government pu publishes um, recommendations and best practice uh, papers as well. So it's always worth looking, looking out for those too. But as a starting point, the ISO standards are a good, are a good thing. Uh, so you've spoken at various AI summits around the world. Could you share some insights from your recent speaking engagements, especially on the topics of demystifying AI and AI ethics? Yeah, absolutely. So I think you know, in the latest presentation, um, I talked about the the challenges certainly with with C level sometimes not understanding that when you bring in an AI team. 80% of their time is going to be spent on sorting out the data. It's going to be spent on the data collection, the data preparation. And I don't think there's always that realization. Um, sometimes these companies bring people in and they expect them to deliver an AI product in six months. And you know the data cleaning could take two years. It really depends how, how um, bad the data is, you know, whether, whether it's, it's in a structured way or whether it's unstructured, whether it's in silos. There's lots of things to consider. And I would say that, that that is a big consideration for sea level. In terms of demystifying that, I think we need to be clearer as an industry to explain that. And maybe there needs to be more training available. Because the only way we're going to see real progress is if, the, is if the people at the top of these companies feel confident and trust in the AI process. So have you had any particularly tough or interesting question hold at you during one of these speaking engagements that you had to really, that made you think? Um, oh, that's a that is a good question. Besides uh, the question I asked you now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I've been asked a lot of questions about bias, um, and I think bias bias mitigation is incredibly important when it comes to video content, and it's very complex because I had a question actually in the in the, my last session today regarding the most challenging um, issue with bias that we've encountered, and I would say the most challenging issue with bias is when you've got an AI product that can scan video content, for example, to identify things. It can pick up biases from the training data. It can pick up biases that's actually in the content itself. So using Hollywood content as an example, Hollywood content may have built-in biases just from the way that it's been shot, the race of most of the actors, the, the way they portray different genders, all that sort of stuff. But if you're building a tool to work on Hollywood content, it may be that that tool in terms of analyzing that content works better with those biases than, than if you take those biases away. And so it, it makes those ethical decisions around wanted and unwanted bias incredibly difficult. And so I would say that is the most challenging thing. And that's why it's so important to have an AI ethics committee to be able to discuss those sort of important issues. Speaking of Hollywood, what's your opinion on the Hollywood AI, anti-AI strike that's happening in the news right now? Uh, it's really interesting. I was actually talking about that in my presentation. I mean, I completely understand where the actors and the writers are coming from. Um, generative AI is very scary. Um, and, and certainly, it has the potential to put a lot of people out of work, I would say. But looking at it from the studio's perspective, you know, a lot of the media and entertainment industry have been struggling for a long time. The streaming wars have really taken their toll. You know, Disney has lost a lot of money from Disney Plus. Um, Netflix have spent a load of money. Prime Video has spent a load of money. It's, it's got to the point where in order to, to produce the amount of content that, that, that needs to be produced to keep people engaged, something's got to give. And, and I think, realistically, they're going to have to start utilizing generative AI, um, whether that's to generate scenes so they don't have to fly a production team around the world to do things so it can reduce their carbon footprint, but also reduce the cost for them. 
whether it's um, having some AI generated actors, which would not be a popular thing to say at this point, but I think you know there are there are going to be things that have to be done to cut cost for a lot of productions to keep up with the consumer demand and to try and maintain their position. Um, as, as one of the leading media and entertainment companies. So I think, I think there is gonna be a to and fro on this. And I, I touched on the fact that actually when we've seen these sort of significant shifts and changes in the media and entertainment space, it's quite common for there to be pushback and skepticism. Um, even when the, uh, we were moving from films without sound to films with sound, some of the actors and actresses were pushing back on it, saying, oh, it's a terrible thing, you know, no one, no one should be um, adding sound to movies. It's like putting lipstick on this famous Greek statue. You know, it was, there was a lot of pushback, and equally when we moved from radio to television, there was the same type of pushback. So I think it's normal to have pushback. I sympathize with the actors and the writers. There are going to be shifts in the industry. I think human in the loop is always the best, so a combination of, of AI and, and humans. And I do think that actually, if they adopt generative AI, it will create AI-related jobs. And so maybe it's more of a question of upskilling those people who are currently doing roles that may be impacted to be able to take some of those roles as well. So what do you think of Sam Altman's statement that we always thought that uh, AI would first come for blue-collared workers and white-collared workers and then finally artists, but we're seeing the opposite. At yeah. First for artists, yeah. then for white-collar workers, and maybe for blue-collar workers. Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting one. I mean, is it coming for artists? That's a good question. Is it coming for artists? Because the current form of AI, it can generate imagery and things but you have to be the creative one to create the prompt, and you have to be the one who has the idea in the first place. The AI is not great at coming up with ideas. If you, if you ask GPT-4 to come up with a script, it won't be great if, if you don't give it a good prompt and, and maybe a template of the script you're looking for in the first place. So I think, yeah, it's a, it's a very tricky question. Has it come for the artists? That's, that's my question. Or has it come for the copywriters? Has it come for the people who are not actually the creatives, but are the people who are, who are you know, maybe building on, on what the creative people have done? That's the question. So let's talk about your involvement with the Swedish Chamber of Commerce for the UK as the chairperson of young professionals, and it's impressive. How do you support and mentor young professionals in the field of AI? Of course. So I've always contributed quite heavily to the Swedish Chamber of Commerce over the years. It's a fantastic organization, and I'm not Swedish myself, but they embrace me. I worked for a Swedish company back in the day called Soundation. And you like hanging out in the Nordics. I, I, and I love hanging out in the Nordics, exactly. Um, so no, it's, it's been a really good opportunity for me to, to network with some really amazing people. And in terms of you know, feeding back, they always have this annual tech forum in London, which is a really well-attended event, and it's great to kind of put people forward as speakers each year and have people um, have the opportunity to speak about the amazing stuff they're doing from my network. And then on top of that, um, we've run a mentoring scheme in the past as well for people actually just leaving school in, who are 18, looking to go to university. And we've been able to mentor them personally um, to help them on that stage of their journey. And I'm always open as well to, to talk to others um, who are at the start of their careers looking to kind of I guess, embark on a career in technology. I recently did a podcast which was distributed to the universities in London, for example, um, that was all about the fact that you don't necessarily need to come from a computer science background to get involved in the AI industry. So in total, you've raised over one million pounds in grant capital. Could you share some strategies and insights for securing funding in the AI and tech startup ecosystem? Thank you. I think, I think a lot of that actually comes from networking, so understanding where the opportunities are. Um, and then it's really hard work. I mean, to secure funding, for example, from Innovate UK in the UK, um, you have to secure an academic partner most of the time. You have to have um, a realistic vision that can be achieved within the budget. You have to be able to put it all in a very detailed Gantt chart. You have to be able to talk about how you're going to commercialize the proposition. There's a lot of work that has to be done. So what I would say is grant funding can sometimes seem to be the, the easy way to get funding, and it isn't. It isn't. They expect just as much as I would say an investor, if not more. Um, when they're looking to scrutinize these projects. And the competition for grant funding is extremely high. Um, it's, it's a welcome thing that the UK has now 
once again joined the Horizon program, which it left during Brexit. Um, the Horizon program, anyone can apply for funding again, but it's, it's a very long process to secure that funding, but it really will help science and technology companies. And so what's your opinion on bootstrapping on the other hand? So I bootstrapped my own startup for, for 12 months and you know, I, I had to do a part-time job alongside leading the startup, so I wasn't getting very much sleep at all. But I think, you know, bootstrapping is a good thing to a point, but it can start to affect your health. <laughs> and <laughs> just from experience, when, when, you're, when you're spending so much time, you know, trying to bring in enough money to keep it ticking over, to pay people, to, to keep, um, to keep your, your vision com coming to life. So I think that, yeah, it's, it can be a challenge, bootstrapping, but I respect anyone who does that and takes that on. Um, but there does always seem to come a point where you do need external investment in one way or another. So what are your best tips for dealing with stress as a startup founder, which you said you don't deal with? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I would say that, you know, I always like to try and get as much stuff done in the time I have available as possible. So I will always put myself under a lot of pressure to get things done um, and to, to achieve certain goals, which are always normally quite tough. So maybe to, to avoid stress, you should be more... Um, uh, realistic with with how you can spend your time and make sure you structure your day to have some downtime as well I, I don't normally do that to be fair um, but but I think for for most people that that would really help I kind of like to feel a little bit of pressure because it reassures me that that things are going in the right direction and that there's a lot going on um, it actually makes me quite unnerved if there's like nothing going on or I feel very very relaxed I'm like what why am I you know so so chilled at the moment <laughs> so what role do you think pressure has to play in the entire startup ecosystem? Do you think competition makes it thrive in the first place? I think so, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, if you're, if you're working on something that you think is groundbreaking, but there is no competition, that, that either raises alarm bells or means you're working on something absolutely incredible. So <laughs> I, think, I think most of the time, investors actually like to see that there are competitive products um, because it shows that there's a market and there's an opportunity. Uh, and I think it takes a lot more to convince an investor to put money into a project if there is no obvious competition. So you were shortlisted for the, if I pronounce it right, the COGX Global Goals Impact Award. Could you tell us more about this recognition and the projects that led to it? Sure. So a lot of the stuff we've touched on already around the International Standards Organization um, artificial intelligence data lifecycle standards. Um, that actually played a really important role in there. It, it covers a lot of the, the UN sustainability goals as well. So I think that was one of the reasons why I was nominated for this. And also the work I've been doing um, in my previous role at the UK regulator was all around helping uh, an organization that's over 100 years old to, to be able to to channel AI to, to actually remain relevant and to cover um, online content with its, with its classifications to help people in the UK and beyond. So I think th those were the kind of things that they saw as, as being positive goals um, for, for, for nominating me for the award. And how has this recognition inspired or motivated you to continue your work in AI and innovation? Oh, it absolutely has. I mean, certainly I would say that you know, from my perspective, social good projects are, are really important to me. They motivate me, and uh, you know, whether the award is going is to have any, or the the nomination for that award is going to have any any lasting impact on that, um, I would say it's it's more of the fact that that's just what motivates me. I like to see projects that have a positive impact um, on society. So I think that's that's really a key thing throughout my whole career. Uh, so lastly, you've launched a podcast called Start a Voice. Yes. What can listeners expect from this podcast and what inspired you to start it in the first place? Sure. So the truth is I was at Slush last year. So Slush is a big event in, in Helsinki where I think it's the, the world's largest startup gathering. I recommend it for anyone. It's, it's great fun, but you learn a lot as well. And I would say that the Startup Voice is really to shine a light on on startups that are working on really exciting projects that are either uh, pre-seed or seed funded, uh, possibly Series A, but where we can shine a light on the founder's journey and you know what inspired them to take, take on this task. Because having run a startup myself, I know how difficult it can be and how challenging it can be. It's not an easy thing 
running your own company. So I would say that it's about giving them an opportunity to talk about the exciting stuff they're doing, raising their profile so that investors can find out about their projects. But also I've got 10 other fantastic individuals who are in the tech sector, um, including the CEO, for example, of the British Design Fund, who are going to present the podcast with me, which will enable us to have um, multiple different views on each podcast and, and different ideas and different perspectives that will, will bring value to the podcast and hopefully make it resonate with a lot of, lot of young people and, and a wider audience as well. Are you planning to go to Slush again this year? I am going to Slush. So yes, if, if any of you are there, um, yes, we'll there fantastic. I will see you at Slush then. So the last question for you is of a personal kind. What would you be doing in your life if not all this? If not all this, that, oh, that is a very good question. I mean, I guess if I, if I wasn't working with AI, I would probably be working in business development, possibly. Um, I always like to try and grow new things. So I'd probably be doing more of a, of a business orientated role that was all around establishing a business. But I think, I think to be honest, I am just really grateful for this opportunity in the tech sector. And it's, it's what drives me. And I see so much potential for this technology moving forward. Yeah.